with a small image. How was how could you ever identify anything like that? You well, well, actually, the, the scale microscope. of the plates, I could detect uh, very small movements uh, of the order of a few seconds of arc. For example, uh, astronomers who measure distances to the nearest stars by the same method here. And they'll take a photograph here and then six months later over here of a star out there. Now, even for the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, I, uh, to show the proper small and how small the angle would be, I'd have to have this board 11 miles long. <laughs> and for Pluto, about twice this length, you see. And mm. yet they can measure things with, la with la large-scale telescopes. Uh, I didn't need that large a scale on the 13-inch. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same thing. It's effective parallax because it's driven from two different points of view, and we know our baseline, you see. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look now at uh, this photograph that we have as part of our set. This is the same one that was on the Gary Moore show. Um, why don't you point out Pluto for us? Uh, there's an arrow pointing to it now, but it's really hard to see, so... Yes. Uh, this little tiny speck right here at the tip of the arrow is the image of Pluto. Uh, this is from a photograph I made on January 29th, 1930. Six nights earlier, I had made another one, and Pluto was over here. Mm -hmm. So I moved that much. Now, this has been greatly enlarged from the original plates. This is a very small section of the original plate. And it shows the, definitely the movement. And everything else is exactly the same. For example, any of these specks in here is just the same on the other plate. Uh, mm -hmm. Identical in configuration and everything. Uh, this uh, ring around this guide star uh, is a spurious thing called effective halation. They didn't have any halation photographs back in those days, mm -hmm. plates. And this is the third magnitude star, and it's about three times fainter than Polaris, the North Star. That's the only thing on this photograph visible to the unaided eye, and yet look at all these that the telescope records. Mm -hmm. uh, the area here is uh, uh, perhaps uh, of the order of about one forty thousandth of the total area that I did in 14 years' work. And mm -hmm. You imagine seeing all of these images, you have to be conscious of seeing every star image to see whether it's shifted position. Mm -hmm. About how many stars did you observe? during your career with this? Uh, uh, in this search over 14 years, I saw individually the images of 90 million star images. 19 million. Uh, by that, I mean I really see them. Uh, you have to uh, narrow your gaze down to uh, perhaps a half a dozen to be conscious that you're seeing them. Mm -hmm. uh, when you just look at this thing point blank, you're just seeing the whole thing. You're not really seeing the individual stars. Something that could have changed and you wouldn't spot it. You've got to narrow your attention down to a very small number. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a few uh, clicks or blinks of the blank microscope to have the alternate view to see if there's a change in position. Well, how do you see, see today? I'm just amazed that you still have any vision. Well, uh, the, uh, uh, the thing is uh, that you focus the eyepiece of the blank microscope for infinity position, that is uh, where your eyes relax like looking at the landscape or out through the window, uh, not something trying to make your eye muscles work and looking at something close. Mm -hmm. And that way your eye is not under strain and you can look for hours and hours without any, any bad results. Uh, I've heard of people uh, claim they don't like to use binoculars because they said it uh, draws their eyes. Well, the, the trouble is they just haven't focused it properly. It's just as easy to, to look through a pair of binoculars or any instrument if you have it properly focused and your eye then is under no strain. But many people do not know, do, do not know the trick of how to do this apparently. And so I, my eyes are very good today. I guess it's practically a certainty that even though you're the discoverer of Pluto, that's not the only observing that you've done. I understand that you did some observations with Mars, and some of your theories about Mars have been uh, substantiated by NASA. Yes, uh, and some, uh, some interpretations are, are also wrong. <laughs> uh, I did a great deal of observing of Mars uh, in my younger days and also the Moon. Uh, the, I consider those some of my specialties, as well as the planets uh, Jupiter and Saturn and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, my, really my specialty is planetary astronomy, although I've done quite a little of some stellar, stellar work too. Mm -hmm. Now astronomy, would people I think would feel that it's a fairly safe profession, but I understand that one time when you were observing in one of those cold, unheated uh, observatories that you found yourself in a little bit of a problem. Yes, well, uh, there was a, uh, one night I was uh, taking my last plate before dawn. Uh, this was before the discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, suddenly some uh, very uh, uh, bad growling broke out right close to the dome 
I didn't know whether it was a mountain lion or a bear, but uh, he sounded very, rather ferocious. And I was uh, really scared out of my wits because if it was possible for him to climb up those lava stones and uh, up through the slit in and after me, and I was afraid he might do that. Well, of course, I was, this was during my exposure. I couldn't leave it without ruining it, and so I uh, would take hasty glances from the eyepiece looking out through the slit to see if I could see a dark form in the dim starlight coming up over that sill. And if it was, I was going to bolt, but not unless I had to. Mm -hmm. Well, after the, uh, he didn't do that, and uh, after a while the growling died away. I could hear it getting fainter, and so apparently he was going away, but I didn't want to take any chances. So after uh, I'd finished my last uh, uh, photograph, I waited a while until it got pretty bright twilight. Then I went downstairs and opened the door and looked all around to make sure I didn't see anything because it was 300 yards to the administration building under the pine trees. And uh, thinking that the, uh, the path was then clear why I made a uh, hasty retreat to the administration building some 300 yards away, but I wasn't taking any chances. Uh, <laughs> and then there were some other instant episodes happened too, but uh, that was one of them. That was a time, that's a hair-raising part of my story. <laughs> I can imagine. What about, uh, there was one time when you nearly froze to death out in one yes, of those places. Yes, uh, I had become so numb that the sensation of cold had disappeared, and I didn't realize that I was in getting a state until I needed to make some small adjustments on the telescope and my fingers wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. In fact, my, I had no uh, feeling in my legs or in my hands either. Mm. And uh, this was a rather dangerous situation. When you no longer feel the cold, you're in a dangerous state. And uh, just sure willpower, we got me back to the administration building. That's, um, oh. <laughs> that's, that's too dangerous for me. I'll stick to sitting inside television <laughs> studios, especially under hot lights. <laughs> uh, what are your favorite parts of the night sky for observations? I mean, what well, would you recommend to an amateur astronomer? Well, of course, uh, any season has its instant constellations and objects to view. Uh, the uh, summer sky uh, has uh, the most of the great globular star clusters, which are really beautiful objects to see in a fairly powerful telescope. But this dense swarm of thousands of faint stars and realizing each one of them is a sun. Then, of course, in the winter sky, we have some of the bright stars, like those in Orion. That's one of the most beautiful constellations, the Great Nebula and Sirius and all those. So, uh, and then in the fall skies, we have the uh, Great Nebula of Andromeda uh, in the east, uh, which is rather interesting it's, uh, to see. It's at a distance of over two million light years. It appears to the unaided eye as a sort of a misty uh, star. Uh, not just a sharp star, and through a pair of binoculars you can see that it is quite a, a, a extended a glowing object. And uh, actually one can see that far without optical aid. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read a letter that, we've, that I got from you. Um, when I talked to you before, you said this was more or less a typical letter of the kind mm -hmm. that you receive from nearly all over the world. Uh, this is from a a, a little girl in uh, La Plata, Maryland, and she writes, Dear gentlemen, we the fifth grade are reading a story. We are reading about Clyde Tombaugh. We want to know if Clyde is still alive. If he is, can I have his autograph? Can you give us some information on Clyde? And then she gives her address. Do you get a lot of letters that say, is Clyde still alive? Yes, quite a few. <laughs> uh, they probably realize that this discovery is back quite a number of years, and uh, uh, but uh, I'm still here. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do all these, these children know about you? Well, uh, this story is printed in the Fifth Reader, uh, apparently in many states, if not over the whole country. Uh, and uh, so it's part of the reading course, and uh, that's how I get uh, letters from all over. Mm -hmm. I've gotten thousands and thousands of letters. In fact, I get a great number of letters from all over the world. And you continue to get them every year? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Uh, what are the chances of a tenth planet or well, beyond? Well, uh, there's a possibility there may be more planets. Uh, it would have to be small and f more remote than Pluto. Uh, but the chances of this probably aren't too good. You see, uh, after the discovery of Pluto, it was, uh, the planet X was much fainter than expected. And there were some doubts as whether this was really Lowell's uh, predicted planet X, that this was just an interloper. And the uh, apprehension arose that the real Planet X was yet to be found, so they wanted me to continue the search. And I went on for another 13 years and uh, finally covered three-fourths of the sky and didn't find anything more. And so uh, uh, 
and I had the capacity with my instrument to pick up a planet like Neptune, uh, the distance of seven times Neptune's distance from the sun. And I can guarantee that there are no more giant planets because there'd be an enormous gap in the Bode's law. Mm -hmm. uh, as to small bodies, uh, that may be a possibility uh, further out, but uh, the chances uh, uh, comb the sky so thoroughly, so much of the sky, that if anybody uh, thinks they're going to find a planet, they've got a hard task ahead of them and have to have even a more powerful telescope and have to deal with perhaps ten times more millions of star images than I had to. What about Soviet claims that they have discovered? Uh, more there planets? were a couple in the past, and then they withdrew them. They apparently had made some mistake or misidentified something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was still nine planets. Then there was another one uh, more recently in America uh, of a tenth planet, and that did not materialize either. These, uh, it, I understand that there's a, a new telescope being built out in uh, California, I guess it is. That's, it, it would be the world's largest, is that correct? Uh, well, the 200 inch is the largest uh, telescope uh, in America. The Soviet Union has uh, someone around about 240 inches. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, these large telescopes are not suited for planet hunting because the field of view is too small. What are your feelings about unidentified flying objects? Are there really other people out there? Well, uh, one hardly knows what to believe about many of the counts. Uh, some of them are definitely hoaxes. But there are, there are things to be seen. In fact, I've seen a few myself, and I did not know what they were. Uh, when one looks at all these stars, these billions of stars in the galaxy, realizing that each one is a sun and may have a system of planets, and some of those are the conditions suitable for life and intelligence on it, uh, then I, I do not think we are alone in the universe by any means. There may be hundreds of millions of planets in our own galaxy that have intelligent life on them at this very moment. Now, if some of them are very advanced in civilization if they haven't committed international suicide. They may be traveling through space, exploring this part of the galaxy, and maybe that's what they are and maybe it is not. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not yet, uh, 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 I have a rather open mind on this. I haven't found anything definite one way or the other. So, now some of the things kind of reported are natural phenomena, and there are a few percent that cannot be attributed to such things, at least as far as we know. Mm -hmm. And that leaves the whole world open for speculation. Right. <laughs> it needs more scientific study. Oh, I hope they get it. And, and I certainly thank you for being with us today. It's been great having you on the show. Like I said before, you're one of the men of the century. Thank you very much, Brad. And uh, I, that will do it for this uh, show about the ninth planet, the mysterious planet, the planet Pluto. Thank you for joining us.